SPCS calls our One World, One Health suite of initiatives. We're going to talk about a part of the world that's uh, certainly very near and dear to me personally, and I imagine a lot of you have traveled to the region. Next slide, please. And the specific program I'm going to talk about is called AHEAD, Animal and Human Health for the Environment and Development. And as part of the One World, One Health approach, it's all about the relationship between human health, wildlife health, domestic animal health, and environmental health and stewardship. Those linkages are what we're going to focus on. The talk is titled Beyond Fences, Policy Options for Biodiversity, Livelihoods, and Transboundary Disease Management in Southern Africa. Sounds like a mouthful, but I hope in the next 15 to 20 minutes it's all going to be very clear. So the, the SADC region from Tanzania on all the way on down to South Africa, this is where you think of the, a lot of the last great places for Plains game in terms of uh, megafauna. Uh, I want to start with what's an iconic image for me, and again, apologizing for the skylights. This is actually a wildebeest dead along a foot and mouth disease control fence. And this is a picture from the early 1990s from my time as the first veterinarian for the Botswana Department of Wildlife and National Parks. But the issues go back to the 1950s uh, and 1960s. And at that time, colonial powers largely and young African governments were really looking for ways to find economic traction. This was pre-diamonds, for example, when you think about countries like Botswana. And to make a long story short, one of the, the approaches that was developed was to try and facilitate the export of livestock, of beef, from the Southern Africa region to Europe. And even in the late 50s and 1960s, it was clear that there was one primary risk that was preventing safe movement of beef, and that's the disease foot and mouth disease. <coughs> foot and mouth disease is a virus that is normally in the African buffalo. African buffalo carry it. They don't get sick from it. But livestock can get it and transmit it. And you probably remember the outbreak in the UK a few years ago, multi-million dollar devastation, farmers committing suicide. This is, dis is a disease that pre presents serious trade barriers. At this time, the thinking was fairly monosectoral. Agriculture was an obvious source of potential economic growth. So if we put it in the context of the time, the attempts to control foot and mouth are somewhat understandable, although it involved the construction in the sub subsequent decades of hundreds if not thousands of miles of disease control fences. And we're going to talk a lot about those fences. Luckily for us, and the reason we're all here, is things have changed quite a bit since the late 50s and early 60s. Today, there are some remarkable changes in the SADC region. And according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, today, nature-based activities, which are primarily photographic tourism, trophy hunting, things like that, contribute as much to GDP as forestry, fisheries, and agriculture combined. I'm going to say that again because it's such a remarkable statistic. Nature-based activities contribute as much to GDP as forestry, fisheries, and agriculture combined. So the whole economic picture has changed, and Southern African leaders have latched onto this, and it, it's going to lead to some very interesting developments. This map shows 13 transfrontier conservation areas, or TFCAs. Definitionally, a transfrontier conservation area is where one or two or more countries have agreed to create corridors between national parks across an international boundary. This often means, ideally, removing a fence so that wildlife can move back and forth. Now, why would they do this? The primary motivator is economic. By increasing the amount of land under wildlife, countries can diversify their portfolios, bring in more revenue. From a conservation point of view, this provi provides an incredible opportunity, really an unprecedented opportunity. And these 13 TFCAs, I'm going to use the term TFCA for Transfrontier Conservation Area, uh, most of them are either in the planning phases or just getting underway. But if you add up all this area, it's about 120 million hectares. To give you some sense of scale, that's if you added up New York, California, and Texas in terms of land area. So this is a huge amount of land that ostensibly will go to wildlife as a primary land use. So when I lecture to vet students, I try and imprint upon them that the reason this type of thing is even being considered is because we're now in a, in a state of play where wildlife is becoming an economically rational and a socioculturally acceptable land use choice. Next slide. Next slide. Out of those 13 TFCIs, I picked one to highlight for you some of the issues regarding what you have to think about when you're reconnecting areas that have been separated by fences for decades. <coughs> This is sort of a prototypical example, and I could talk about any number of these TFCAs. And again, uh, this is where this is the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, where South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe come together. 
Again, to give you a sense of scale, this ellipse here is about 100,000 square kilometers, almost exactly the same size as the state of Virginia. This is a very big area, and I don't want to, you to misconstrue this. This is not about these three countries creating one giant national park, but it is about creating land use change so that some of the core protected areas, like South Africa's Kruger National Park, Zimbabwe's Ghana Rajon National Park, Limpopo National Park, and Mozambique, can be reconnected. There's still people living in the area. There's irrigation agriculture. There are railroads. There are villages. We're talking about essentially rezoning in particular areas to expand the land under wildlife, increasing those economic opportunities we were talking about. Well, if you're going to do that, if we're going to talk about taking down fences, and there was a fence between South Africa and Mozambique here, what does that mean? I'm going to give you three or four very quick examples just to highlight the issues. On the Mozambique side, rabies is a big problem. I'm sure you've all heard of rabies. It's a problem because feral dogs are not well controlled. Uh, vaccination coverage is very poor. And it's often children, like in many countries with bad rabies problems, it's often children who get bitten by dogs and die of rabies. Until this fence started to come down between Mozambique and Kruger, there had never been a case of rabies documented in Kruger National Park. And Kruger is the best studied park on the continent in terms of disease. Well, if you have a new virus like rabies coming into an ecosystem like Kruger's, it could be ecologically devastating. So we have a cross-sectoral impact from one side to the other. I want to talk about bovine tuberculosis. A lot of you have heard of it. Bovine tuberculosis is a zoonotic disease, meaning it moves between animals and people. It's very much like regular tuberculosis that you hear about all the time. About 160 years ago, European cattle brought bovine tuberculosis into this part of southern Africa. That means it's an alien invasive disease. It doesn't even belong there. But it came in nonetheless. And in 1990, scientists found it in the southern boundary of Kruger National Park for the first time in wildlife. And that wasn't that long ago. Since 1990, bovine TB has moved up the entire park, starting out in Buffalo, spilling over into a whole range of species, from cheetahs to baboons. Uh, it's, it's lions. You've probably seen some of the pictures of the emaciated lions. Well, if we're going to create a corridor, ostensibly to reconnect Kruger with Ghana Rajon National Park, one of the main options being looked at is right here. It's called Sengwe. It's a communal area with thousands of people and thousands of cattle. The other thing you need to know about Sengwe in Zimbabwe is it's among the highest HIV AIDS prevalence regions in, in, in this part of uh, southern Africa. So if you've got a lot of immunosuppressed people, you really have to worry about diseases like bovine tuberculosis because they're very susceptible to it. So in this case, as we think about the corridor, we have to think about the fact that these people not only have a high HIV AIDS prevalence, they don't have good milk uh, processing, they don't boil their milk, and they don't have good meat hygiene, all factors that contribute to the spread of diseases like TB and BTB. In this case, what we're talking about here is potentially a conservation vision causing significant problems in livestock agriculture and public health. And if you, if you take nothing else home from today, really the whole animal and human health for the environment and development, the whole AHEAD initiative is about trying to make sure that one sector, in this case my sector, conservation, doesn't cause more problems for other sectors than it solves by creating economic opportunities in the natural resource sector. So it's a cross-sectoral approach. And these are scary diseases I'm talking about, but the message is all of them can be dealt with if you are proactive, not if you wait till the zebra's out of the barn. Last quick example, up here we have trypanosomiasis, or Nagana, sleeping sickness of cattle, spread by the tsetse fly. If we're going to reconnect this landscape, we have to be very cognizant of what kind of habitat tsetse flies need. That way, we can, can keep them confined in this part of Zimbabwe and not let them spread. Why don't we want tsetse flies to spread? Well, Nagana, sleeping sickness of cattle, was eliminated from South Africa in 1903, and they don't want it back. Since then, South Africa's Kruger National Park has become the largest source population of white rhinos on the planet. There are thousands of white rhinos who are actually rather susceptible to trypanosomiasis. And on the western boundary of Kruger, there's a lot of livestock. And they don't want trypanosomiasis back either. So I'll tell you right now, when I lecture to vet students, this slide is an hour-long talk. But I'm going to spare you. <laughs> I wanted to give you three somewhat random examples, because I could give you three more. We don't have the time that over the, over the decades that these three countries have been separated, ecologically, the disease environments have evolved differently. And so if we're going to reconnect it, and if it makes sense to do that, we have to proactively deal with some of those diseases. And there are ways to do that. And we'll try and get to that in the, probably in the Q&A. Next slide. So diagrammatically, I just want to hammer home some of the key issues here. I've talked about two types of diseases in this, in this situation. We have the zoonotic pool, diseases that move between animals and people, like rabies and bovine tuberculosis. And then the non-zoonotic diseases, like foot and mouth, that doesn't actually make people sick, but has huge livelihood implications. If we look at this side of the diagram, those diseases have huge impacts on animal production and livelihoods. 
And if we look on the conservation side, they have huge impacts on wildlife production, if you will, conservation, and all the spillover impacts on tourism and hunting and those associated economic activities. Well, the ag side and the conservation side all feed into local, national, and regional economies. That's what we're talking about. And I decided to put disease control strategies at the center of this diagram because how we choose to deal with this disease issue really will indicate how successful we are at mitigating cross-sectoral negative impacts. So if we're going to build fences, we need to think about the environmental impacts as well as the social impacts. And if we're going to use a pesticide to get rid of a certain vector like the tsetse fly, we need to know, does it cause any other uh, health problems for people? So if we're, if we're more sensitive about these cross-sectoral impacts, we think we can see some very successful outcomes. But as I said, back in the 50s and 60s when these fences were thrown up, the wildlife sector wasn't contributing to ec economics. Nobody cared. And so hundreds of thousands of animals died because they couldn't get to grazing and water at certain times of year. And that's what the fences did to the natural resource side of this equation. Next slide. It's all about livelihoods. This is a picture of some, some, some kids in a village. And really, as a conservationist, none of this is going to work again unless it's economically rational and socioculturally acceptable. And so that's why these cross-sectoral impacts are so important. I want to summarize some of these issues looking forward. A lot of the experience I've talked about related to the Great Limpopo, where we've been working since 2003, and this, this part of the world is where I've spent most of my career, Southern Africa. This is the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. That's where five countries, Angola, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, have come together and agreed to create what will be the largest land area dedicated to conservation on the planet if it's successful. This area is about 400,000 square kilometers. That's about, to give you a sense of scale, one and a half times the size of the UK, of Great Britain. Okay? There are approximately 36 national parks. If you've been to the region, you've been to Chobe or Moremi or Kafui. This is where a lot of the prime wildlife activity is in the region. In order to create this vision for transfrontier conservation, obviously a lot of things have to, to come about. And I'm just talking about the health sector, but we're not, we're, we didn't invent this. This is something that's growing out of the region, and we have lots of partners. USAID is here, US Fish and Wildlife is here, Conservation International, World Wildlife Fund, African Wildlife Foundation. This is, a, like I said, the biggest conservation dream on the planet, so a lot of players are involved. But the reason we got involved is because our, our specific niche is on that livestock, wildlife, human health interface. And that, in my opinion, is make or break in this landscape because we're talking about connectivity, right? We want to restore wildlife movements that have been erased over the past several decades. Well, the physical barrier here is disease control fencing. How can we get around that? How can we still have export agriculture and deal with foot and mouth disease and create transfrontier conservation areas? It's a real problem in the region right now. Next slide. I wanted to show you at least one image of what these fences really look like. This is from Namibia. This is a double cordon fence, and if maintained, most planes game is just not going to get through that. So these, these fences, as I said, are cutting off migratory pathways that have been in place for eons. And in seasonally, as you know, when they need water or grazing at certain times of the year, if there's a fence, they're going to die. Next slide. Okay, if you think back to the Kavango Zambezi map I showed you, this is the same region. These are the main foot and mouth disease fences in this part of the world. That's quite a set of compartments. If you're a wildebeest or a springbok, you're not going to be able to navigate this. So I just wanted you to, to understand that the physical barriers to this vision for transfrontier conservation are very real. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we going to do? All right, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't think these problems were solvable, but it's going to take a paradigm shift. We've learned a heck of a lot since the late 50s and early 60s about diseases like foot and mouth. Our science is much better, and today there are a number of tools we can bring to bear. And they mostly relate to changing the way we think about disease control. I'll give you one example in the time that we have. It's called commodity-based trade. Some of you are likely quite familiar with this. It already exists. And what it essentially is is taking beef and beef-derived products through value-added processing. Instead of sending a half a carcass from Botswana to the UK, you process the meat in the country. And by quarantining the animals properly, deboning it, taking out all the lymph nodes, making a nice deboned steak, and aging it, foot and mouth disease virus doesn't survive. But that science is relatively new, and these policies are entrenched going back decades. It's kind of like the Electoral College. You kind of wonder why we still do it. Well, that's sort of what this is. If we can bring the science to bear, and we can show that beef can be safely exported without the need for physical barriers, it changes the development equation for this part of the world. 
This, this is uh, something that we're talking about with the OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health. We're in discussions with the FAO, and we're obviously in discussions with the countries. The other nice thing about value-added processing, the country of origin makes that much more money per unit of production. In other words, if it's Botswana or Namibia, they're selling a processed product for a higher premium rather than the Europeans making more of the revenue based on that same value, that same increment of product. So commodity-based trade can free up Southern Africa from the need for these fences. And that's one of the main strategies we're looking at right now to create win-win opportunities. The, the implications are tremendous. Next slide. Next slide. This is a, a child playing. Uh, and again, it's to remind me to, to talk to you about that this is all related to the future of Southern Africa, and particularly when we're talking about food security. Right now, obviously, the U.S. government has a big renewed focus on food security in the SADC region. This, in my opinion, is potentially the most significant development for the SADC region, certainly in, in, in my career, where we have the opportunity to increase the resilience of this part of the world, particularly given the uncertainties related to climate change. As an example, when it's very dry, which most of the climate change models predict for the SADC region, wildlife for a reasonable amount of time can do very well, and so can tourism and hunting. When the rains are good, livestock can do well. We're creating a diversified, a diversified portfolio that really hasn't been in place to the same degree that, it, that we, can, we can get it. At the same time, we've got improvements in livelihoods, we've got that diversification, we've got enhanced food security, and we're basically talking about using veterinary science to improve conservation outcomes and development outcomes. And part of my role, and the reason I'm actually based in Washington, is to help development partners understand the relationships between these sectors. We're all guilty of working in our own parallel lines. This is true at any donor agency, it's true in NGOs. The ag folks work on ag, the wildlife folks work on wildlife, the public health folks work on public health. But real world problems are like this, as I talked about with rabies and BTB. If we can bring these sectors together and free up trade and expand the economic growth that way, wow, taking down those fences and providing that connectivity, we have an unprecedented growth opportunity for Southern Africa, which is why the leaders of these countries have agreed to create those 13 TFCAs. Secondarily, there's a huge biodiversity benefit, but the motivator is largely economic and understandably so. Next slide. I know I've talked really fast because you guys are really busy. I've got a ton of information on our website. We've got a whole book on this that's free on the web, downloadable as a PDF. We've got handouts about it out there. Uh, if you need any information on any of this, don't hesitate to contact anyone from ICCF or WCS uh, because I mean, we've devoted decades to this work, and I've tried to summarize some of the high points in about 20 minutes. Next slide. And hopefully, if our host permitting, I would love to take Q any questions that uh, 